Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to, as we said, today's uh, joint Red Hat and JFrog discussion on DevSecOps. My name is Philip Lamb, and I am the Senior DevOps Solutions Architect for Red Hat's Global Partners and Alliances ISV team. Prior to joining Red Hat, I was a developer for more than 15 years, most recently specializing in assisting with the digital transformation of the state of North Carolina's Department of Information Technology. I'm joined today by JFrog Sven Ruppert, who's a developer advocate and Dev DevSecOps extraordinaire. Sven, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hello, thank you for being here. It's, it's a pleasure to have you all here. So my name is Sven Ruppert, I'm developer advocate at JFrog, and I'm specialized here on DevSecOps, and my history is more or less from consulting worldwide in the Java ecosystem. So, and this, I think we could start, and I'm giving back to Philip. Yep. Okay. So uh, let me click this button. There we go. All right. So uh, this talk is a part of Red Hat's monthly security series, which we've called with a kind of shout out to the Mandalorian, DevSecOps is the way. And despite it actually being July now, uh, this is a part of the June series on application analysis. And so every month, Red Hat is going to be hosting three podcasts and two OpenShift TV shows per month, in addition to a number of webinars like this one. So let's just jump in and get started by uh, maybe answering a few questions that may be on some of your minds, which is uh, what is DevSecOps really? So a lot of us have heard of DevOps, which is combining people and process and technology together in order to solve problems. But what about DevSecOps? So DevSecOps and DevOps are basically the same thing. Both are methodologies dedicated to observing your organization and making small changes to break down the barriers and silos in your organization and help realize operational efficiencies. What we're doing by specifically calling out the SEC in DevSecOps is to help remind you to include security from the get-go. So let's uh, briefly look at the old way of doing things kind of represented by this, by this slide. We have a development team that writes some code to implement a new feature for their product. They're under very tight deadlines and they need to release something quickly. I'm sure we've all have heard that before. A quick search returns a new library that they can include to get 80% of the required functionality built out. So we're an agile organization using DevOps and we have a Kubernetes based container platform in place. And specifically in this case, it's OpenShift since OpenShift is the best option for enterprise Kubernetes. And because we're running Kubernetes, we're going to build a container image to house the application that was built. But you need a base image to do that. So the dev team will do another search and pull another base image randomly from the internet. So because dev and ops were speaking to each other, we are practicing DevOps after all, the operations folks are in the loop and can make recommendations on system architecture, deployment patterns, et cetera. But unfortunately, security has been left out. So they get wind of a new feature and ask some questions about how it's being built out exactly. And they're going to have some very strong opinions on the provenance of dependencies, which means that some or all of the dependencies that have been utilized to build this new feature will need to be removed or re-architected, which means that the dev team just got handed a ton of extra work that they had not planned on. And that 80% gain in dev time we talked about earlier is lost, which means that the dev folks, and I can I definitely attest to this, the dev folks are typically very gun shy about talking to security in any way. So this is kind of a small example of what can happen by not involving security as far left in the process as possible. It's not healthy for the teams and it's definitely not healthy for the business. So instead, with a DevSecOps approach, we involve security from the start. They help guide the sourcing of desired dependencies and put into place uh, scanning tools and other fail safes to ensure the correct provenance of trusted dependencies. Automation can ensure that they stay secure and alert the DevSecOps combined team if any issues ever crop up with the selected dependencies. So now we're basically doing the following. Uh, we pull down containers from the internet, we scan them as we pull them down, we put them into a trusted registry, we scan that registry as well, and then we build out our container image. So we can trust, we can now trust our, our code and our dependencies. So we're ready to deploy our application, right? Well, not quite. 
we wouldn't be doing our due diligence if we weren't scanning the application container image too, in order to avoid any hidden security issues that might result from the combination of dependencies required for the application. Through this example, we can see the benefits that result from weaving DevSecOps into your environment. So that's improved security by removing more vulnerabilities in development, which will reduce potential issues in production. We're improving efficiency and speed of DevOps release cycles by removing legacy security practices and tools and leveraging automation. And then finally, we're reducing risk and improving visibility by leveraging tools and processes to improve compliance and reduce the possibility of human error. This improves the predictability and repeatability, all while reducing audit concerns. So Red Hat and its partner ecosystem, of which JFrog is a big part, helps customers implement DevSecOps no matter where they are in their journey. Uh, we can help with not just technology, but also the very important culture and process, which is foundational to any set of technologies that you choose. Bringing all of these together provides customers the help they need in order to build security into their applications and into the lifecycle with management and automation tools, as well as security partner tooling for comprehensive DevSecOps. So in order to help structure our approach to a kind of holistic DevSecOps solution, we've established a framework which shows how Red Hat technologies lay a foundation for DevSecOps. We then add a compelling security partner ecosystem to ensure that we have a comprehensive platform for customers and solutions integrators to build on. We're partnering with both longtime industry leaders and visionary startups to ensure we provide customers choice to solve their unique challenges. We further have refined our framework by identifying 34 key DevSecOps methods within each of the nine categories. This then allows us to visualize all of the moving parts of a functional DevSecOps ecosystem. And so here's what we came up with from that uh, visualization standpoint. Uh, we map the most common security technologies as a starting point to understand what methods are utilized and where. And you can see here how the right side is much heavier with technologies. So this creates a huge burden on the teams there and also is closest to where there are more users touching the environment. And this is why there's such a strong emphasis on the term shift left. So fixing security vulnerabilities early in the cycle should result in less stress on the right side of the equation and fewer breaches overall. And then here you can see how we've mapped out the ways that the partnership with JFrog extends and enhances the already enterprise proven capabilities of Red Hat technologies. The chart really helps emphasize the shift left nature of JFrog's artifactory and X-ray. So I'd like to briefly touch on a brand new certification that we've established. So today, uh, Red Hat's customers are escalating issues regarding discrepancies with vulnerability risks on Red Hat containers and packages found in the customer's vulnerability scanning tools. So for example, a customer built a container with a base image of RHEL 7. They notice then that RHEL 7 has the health index of A. Then they use X-ray to scan their image and the scanning tool indicates the image has, for example, critical or high vulnerabilities. Panic ensues and Red Hat support gets another ticket. So in order to help solve these challenges, our security segment has created a vulnerability scanner certification. It ensures that our partner scanning tools are consuming Red Hat security OVAL v2 data feed, correctly identifying files that are installed by RPMs, determining which product installed the RPM to determine the correct severity, state, and fix. So a CVE can affect different products in different ways, and then finally displays Red Hat data in their UI and scan reports, including Red Hat's four point scale for impact, as well as Red Hat security page URLs. We've worked with JFrog on this and they are now one of the first of our partners to receive this vulnerability scanning certification. So congratulations JFrog. And with that, I'd like to hand over the reins to Sven for his insights into how to get started on your DevSecOps journey. Sven. Uh, thank you, Phil. This was very, very compressed 10 minutes with all the details. That was good. So now I want to start a little bit more from the practical view. So we got the overview where it's coming from, what is the mechanics so in, in the big thing. And one question could be, what does it mean for you as a developer? So now I will have to do a tricky, uh, tricky part 
I have to start my screen sharing. So be patient with me. I will start doing it right now. Sharing my screen. No, presenting. So presenting. And here is my screen share. So the first thing I have to do is I have to find out how to get the chat back and all this. Otherwise, I'm not seeing if there's any Q&A. And if anyone can, of you knows how I, to, I, I, hey Sven, I can watch, I can watch the, the chat for you. Not yeah, a problem. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. So, so I got it. I got it. So there's always this, I don't know if anyone of you knows it. If I'm start presenting in Zoom, then the chat window will disappear. And I have no idea why and have no idea how to deactivate it. So if any one of you knows it, please let me know. It's really a big question for me since since COVID, one and a half years. Oh my God, time is running. So let's start. So um, if, if you want to start with DevSecOps, so if you really want to get hands dirty because you want to do it right now and you have the first impression, so wow, security, so many tools, so many different aspects, so many different layers. So what is the easiest thing you could start immediately if you have to start now? And this is more or less called, in my words, so what are the low hanging fruits? So if you're talking about security and what are the quick wins? So if you start now, what is the best path to start for you as a developer? Um, if, you're, if you're thinking about the whole development chain, the whole production line is more or less in different hands and everybody has to do its own part of it. It's, I will cover this in, in a few minutes. So how to start with the security in this DevSecOps. Okay, so now let's see. How to switch to the next slide. Ah, yeah, so, uh, and again, if you want to reach me after this webinar, tomorrow, in a few weeks, the best way to reach me is Twitter, is LinkedIn. You can jump to my homepage, but if you want to see more of this outdoor style IT videos, I have done amazing, a lot of videos on YouTube. I have it in German, I have it in English. I would really appreciate to see you as many subscribers on my YouTube channel and let me know what you think about it. Give me a few thumbs up, subscribe my channel and let me know what you want to see us next. And with this, we are on the topic, what is here the, the basic mechanics, how to start? Don't worry, I don't want to go in all these details about this cloud native. Cloud native for me right now is just an excuse. Whatever I'm saying here is possible with all kinds of project management and styles or whatever, because we are going back to the, really to the roots of the security, how to implement it, how to get it done. But DevSecOps is a very good way to, to implement it. And we will see that in the cloud native, Fields, they are already talking about DevSecOps instead of pure DevOps. So even the security is now part of the wording and it's part of the definition. And this is why I'm choosing cloud native and cloud native is one thing that most of you want to go in the future or they are already going through. But what does it mean? We have different layers, uh, for example, that we want to split up several things in different services. It's nothing really new, but we will see that this whole service oriented architecture whatever technology you're using long long time ago they, they spoke about um, i think so arm i and all this maybe one of you knows it and saw it once but um the main thing here is that we we want to split different use cases into some services and we have to decide what is the best place for this use okay so this is one service or there's two use cases in one service. So this is something a human has to decide. Is this a good thing where you can deal with technology that they're helping you immediately with the security part? My, my thinking about it is it, no, because we don't have so many good tools that just looking at a bunch of use cases and are able to extract it because this is more domain specific. This is something a human has to do. It's security by design. It's part of the security, but it means that you as a human has to do way more than um, just applying a few tools. If you're talking about API oriented communication, so now the services start communicating to each other. Um, 
what's happening here? Yeah, it's it's more technology because the communication itself. So how to make a handshake? What is a protocol? How to make an, uh, an encryption layer and all this stuff? This is technology stuff. What is going off the wire is something the human has to decide. So here we, we see a shift that the tooling can do more and more for you, but not everything. So it's not a no brainer. If you're going to the container based infrastructure, what we heard here today is, is that here we have a huge tool stack that's already managing it. So if you're talking about resilience, if you're talking about uh, secured communication between nodes and all this stuff, this is something where technology is being very, very strong. And from my point of view, it's the strongest part for technology or for tool that are working with you and for you is inside the DevSecOps layer. So it means exactly what you are doing if you are start coding. So with this splitting up in different use cases, what change over the time and what's influencing our thinking about security, what is part of security and how to implement this one is more or less, we, we are shifting to more and more shorter release cycles. So instead of maintaining software, we, we are now, yeah, thinking, oh, it's not nice. We are just grabbing it, throwing it away, starting from scratch. It's good because you can get rid of old stuff that's maybe boring or maybe not good. And you can do it from scratch easily compared to earlier days. But on the other side, if you're doing something from scratch completely new, you have a good chance that you have new vulnerabilities or new bugs in it. So it's it's a trade-off. So I don't want to say left or right is better. I just want to highlight getting rid of old stuff is good and bad in the same time or in the same way. Shorter lifetime means you're just during the time you're coding, you're not optimizing your software for a long maintenance period, but you can focus on the use case, you can focus on different aspects because this long maintenance is not really part of it anymore and this will give you some freedom to take new decisions take new advice from outside whatever but if you have a bunch of different um, services then between the services or in your whole tech stack we are talking about a polyglot environment there is not this single server with an operating system and then you have your application running on top of it no it's now wrapped in different layers, it's distributed. We are talking per definition about a polyglot distributed system. And distributed system itself, this is, it's, it's a cool thing, but have in mind, it's a distributed system. Well, so it's not so easy. But kicking all this stuff out, so saying, okay, I don't want to hear about this um, orchestration and all this stuff because I'm, I'm focusing on implementing one thing. So this is what I'm as a developer doing, or I am ramping up one service or whatever. So this is a task you're doing. You're not concurrently working on at the same time, in the same minute, in the same second with two keyboards, you're writing two, two services. You're focusing always in one thing. So I'm cutting all this stuff out. And now focusing just on, on one single microservice, on one monolith, on one application, whatever. So what we're doing is we, we are writing some code, the application itself, and then we start wrapping it in layers, layer after layer after layer. And what happens is here that we have a multidimensional um, environment in terms of what is domain specific and what is technical. And again, domain specific things, the machine is not really good to help with security because how to make this process secure, how to make sure that this is fulfilling the governmental rules, how to make sure this is this is not what the machine can do good. So the machine is good in, for example, making sure that there is a test coverage, making sure there is this thing running or linked or bind or compiled or all this stuff. This is what a machine is good in. So talking about the application itself, this is what I'm writing, so the source code. And if this is running, if my use case is implemented, then I'm wrapping it in operating system, for example, Linux or whatever you are taking. And then the next layer is in Docker environment. So what you're doing at this layer is coding in the first one and the next one is using, you're using operating system. Mostly you're not writing kernel driver. So then you're wrapping it in the next layer. So in this Docker universe, if you want to 
uh, shift it out and then in some kind of virtualization unit so that you can distribute it and so on. So you have this infrastructure that is running somehow. So what's happening here? It's, it's like non-yen. So with every layer, you are adding per definition more vulnerabilities. With an additional layer, you never removing vulnerabilities. And one thing that people mostly forgetting or not, not thinking about is if you're talking about security, we are not talking about or not only talking about vulnerabilities, compliance issues. So the right license at the wrong place in a business can destroy your business as well. So if I'm talking about security, I'm talking about security in terms of vulnerabilities and so, uh, talking about security in terms of business security. So compliance issues, there are several other aspects as well. So this for sure. But in general, I'm focusing on two things a machine can identify very good, and this is vulnerabilities and compliance issues. <clears throat> the most people just thinking about the text that they're producing, but there's a big beast behind. There's a huge thing, and this is called the DevOps steps. It's exactly the tools that you're using. Just, just as a side note, who of you heard about the SolarWinds hack? Most of you, I assume. But what happened here? What's the difference here? The SolarWinds hack was just, so there was this company SolarWinds and, and they're producing software. So like you and me, they're just coding stuff and distributing binaries to customers. And this company was hacked with a tool set. These people start uh, earlier, earlier um, has stolen at, at a company called Fire. I don't want to go into too much details, but in the end, the SolarWinds company has 300,000 customers or so. So they are delivering software to a huge amount of people. And what they're distributing is some kind of software that's managing infrastructure. So in managing infrastructure means you need very high rights to manage this infrastructure. So if something is wrong with this software, this is a huge thing. Yeah? And well, the hackers, this group hacked the company network from SolarWinds, they go, uh, they went into this um, environment and what they've done is they're not even destroyed a service or stole some data or whatever. No, they compromise the CI environment. So damn, they, they changed the CI environment in a way that this environment started producing compromised binaries. So the company itself, so They've done a good job in their software, but with every build, they created compromised binaries and pushed them via their updates to all of the customers. Potentially 300,000, I think they affected 20,000 or so immediately. So it's, it's a huge thing. So, and this means not only check the stuff you're using and producing, so not only your tech stack that is running in production, secure the whole environment, not only the stuff that is running in production, the whole production line. So at what time you scan the last time your Jenkins server against known vulnerabilities? Just as a side note, think about it, try it, and you will see you have so many components. You have routers, you have network switch, whatever. They're using Debian, for example, or they're using some other Linux distribution. So they can be um, affected as well. So the whole infrastructure, whatever you're using, down to your compiler, down to whatever you're doing. So everything is here. And now let's see what, what we can do here. There is one term called shift left. And this shift left is um, more or less, we want to go with security from operations, uh, over testing to development to the um, definition of what should be done. So uh, security by design, this security by concept or by design and excluding because it's not a technical part, it's it's um, um, it's uh, something that is before we start with the pure DevOps. So it's a definition phase. So I'm excluding it here right now, but shift left means, or the way I remember how to shift left, what does it mean is that I'm rotating this picture, 90 degree, and shift left means start as early as possible. So, so what is early and how to start with this? What we saw so far is that if you're talking about um, this, whole taste stack. And we have to secure every piece of it because everything could be compromised with vulnerabilities, with misconfiguration, with whatever. Means that we have to think about what is the 
biggest part here. So what is the biggest part we can influence and what is the right time to influence it? it we have different steps here. But if you're talking about an application, I'm a Java guy, so I'm just taking my Maven and then I'm coding my stuff. So it means corresponding to my application, I have a Maven repository. And this Maven repository is responsible to grab everything that I'm not doing by myself. So I'm not reinventing the wheel. I'm just taking the advantage that some someone else has done it already. The same with the Linux um, uh, or with, with some operating system, whatever operating system you're using, you have some corresponding repository types that are able to manage this binary. So what, what are the repositories? It's more or less a way to distribute binaries in a way that's uh, with a version, with a name, so with coordinates, you have different attributes. Uh, uh, mostly it's these repositories have so some kind of um, caching and all this stuff in say, but in general, you can say it's an access layer for uh, external provided binaries. External could be everything, even inside your company in a different department, different group, uh, your colleague, whatever. So everything that's ex exchanging binaries. Then, even with the Docker statement, you start with a from statement. So it means even there you're declaring a dependency immediately and grabbing something, Helm charts, and so on and so on. And again, the most of you are not thinking about the tool stack itself. So how to start, how to store uh, all the binaries you need for your production. Why? If you're talking about security, it means that you are thinking in an ideal world about an immutable system. Immutability means that everything you're pushing to production must be available so that we can recreate the state. And this is not only your jar, it's the operating system and it's your compiler and it's your built infrastructure, it's everything. So if you really want to have an immutable system, you can take this a little bit more broad in aspects, because if you have everything managed, you are independent from outside, if this is available, yes or no, so that's one thing. You can scan everything that is somewhere stored against known vulnerabilities, if there's compromise and so on. And the other thing is you can recreate the state every time completely independent from the outside world. So we have the solution called Artifactory that is more or less handling all these package managers. And if you have this place where all this knowledge, not only, not only the storage of the binary, because the binary itself is not, not really the only interesting thing. Think about Maven dependencies. You have this artifact, um, artifact ID and group ID on a version. So you're identifying one entity there. But then you have all these transitive dependencies. You have all these dependencies that this dependency is using, so it's this indirect dependencies. So what you need to have an ideal, or not an ideal word, but to have a good idea what you're really using or what is affecting a system means you need a full impact graph. You need something that's understanding the whole metadata that's around because you can just scan everything if you know it. So if you're just scanning binary and say, mm, yeah, this binary has no matching pattern in, it's not enough, you need the metadata. So in Artifactory, we have that metadata because we are understanding here this part, this um, ecosystem, this package managers. And this is a perfect place for X-Ray. X-Ray is a security scanner that is able to read all this stuff. So and if you're looking at this uh, slides, you will see that if you're understanding all these package managers and all these binaries are going over this Artifactory instance, then X-Ray is able to analyze the whole stack. So it means it could extract the whole impact graph if you have something to do with vulnerabilities. So you see this jar is in this web archive, is used in this Docker layer, is used in Docker, this Docker image, is used in this Helm chart. So you know in production exactly where everything is without scanning production. So this is why this combination of package management and security is a very strong one if you're talking about static um, application security testing. We have different aspects if you want to start with DevSecOps. So you have mostly this time to market. So what, what is the most important thing from the economy part of you? You have a use case, you have to implement it as fast as possible and you have to deploy it as fast as possible. And on the other side, you have this make or buy. Make or buy means that you have to decide as a developer, should I write this PDF functionality or should I use a dependency? And what you're doing is you're making exactly this, this uh, decision. So should I do it by myself or should I buy it? Mostly 
we are buying, we are adding a dependency because this is good. We are not reinventing the wheel. We want to focus on our use case and this is good. Time to market means we have to optimize everything, but we need exactly this optimization. So this CI environment, this DevOps platform to automate all steps. So if we have some request for change to push it through the whole pipeline as fast as possible, a lot of companies have a slightly different behavior between there's a use case they're defining it everything's fine and then they say push it to production so there is no formal process in the background that says okay you have it now we have to revalidate everything and discuss and do and give permission and now push it to production so the the deployment cycles are so far that we're not talking about deploys per month or deploys per weeks we are talking about deploys per day so we are deploying a lot more than, than 10 years ago. On the other side, if we are talking about vulnerabilities, immediately, oh, there must be a permission, there must be one person that's responsible for all this. So we have the whole infrastructure, but then we have a process where a human is involved in a critical step that's blocking everything. And this is why I want to highlight. So if you want to start with an efficient implementation of security, you need to optimize or to um, automate everything that's possible so that there is no blocker based on human interaction. So time to market and make or buy, this is very important. If you want to have a little bit more detailed view on this, check out my bit.ly links. I have it in English and in German, and I will give you there the full explanation, what I mean, what, what the impact and all this stuff. But if you are now thinking about make or buy. Okay, we, we have the CI environment, we have the whole infrastructure that something is built very fast and pushed to production very fast. Now it's the other thing, this make or buy. How important is this make or buy or what, what, how powerful is this? If you're looking at all these layers, starting with the application, we, we are writing code. And if you are writing code, then maybe a few hundred thousand lines of code. But if you're checking how many lines of code we are grabbing via dependencies, mostly, way more. Going to the operating system, I'm writing mostly just a few configurations. But if I'm using this configuration to manage the whole um, stack of my operating system, then I'm dropping way more lines of code in. I'm not writing a kernel job. I'm using operating system. Same with Docker, same with Kubernetes or whatever you're using. Um, and a dependency is your whole dev stack. So everything, your CI environment, your compiler, your whatever, these are all binaries. These are all things you are buying, dependencies. So treat it like a dependency. So treat a Maven dependency in the same way as you're treating your image for your CI environment. That's it. So and looking at all these layers, you will see that uh, the uh, balance between lines of codes and dependencies uh, there is inside the application the biggest part of make compared to buy. And mostly in all other layers is way worse. So make part is tiny compared to the buy parts, so the dependencies. If you're looking at the whole tech stack, for the most projects I know, the dependencies over the whole package is by far bigger than 90%, even more. So what does it mean? If I know I have some part written by myself and I have a huge part that is a dependency, what should I focus first? I should focus on dependency because this will have the biggest impact. So if I know how to manage efficiently binaries and if I know how to scan them against vulnerabilities and compliance issues, then I have the biggest part immediately. And if you're re reading a little bit in, in um, not only magazines, but if you're reading a little bit about security, cybersecurity and all this stuff and statistics, you will see that the most mathematical background of people um, expecting that the amount of known vulnerabilities is way bigger than the non-known or the unknown vulnerabilities. And all the time, the amount of known vulnerabilities will, will constantly grow. Uh, that means that focusing on known vulnerabilities in the first step is just a logical step 
from different angles, whatever you're looking at it. So it's it's the most important thing here to start with this. So if you want to start with steps about focus on dependencies, treat all dependencies in the same way, make sure that you have this logical point where everything's going through so that you are able to extract the full impact graph. And just for all these people from US, we are just talking about this executive order no? in this field of cybersecurity. And this means we are sooner as later have to deal with ASPOM, with the software builds of material. So we need this full impact graph anyway. So if you have artifact where everything is in and you can extract the full impact graph, well, you have the ASPOM already. So you have your software builds of material already. So uh, just as a side note, um, check it out. Um, I have a few other um, webinars that are coming up uh, about exactly this, um, about this executive order part. But well, the other thing is, if you have a vulnerability, how to get rid of vulnerabilities. If you want to get rid of vulnerabilities, you have, you need the full impact graph as well. And then you need something that's able to address these binaries. So there's a vulnerability in one jar that is wrapped in one web archive, it's in some Docker lay. So how to identify all components that are directly or indirectly using this compromised binaries. And this was exactly the pain with solar winds. So how to get rid of it. So in the end, what you need to do is you have to remove all these binaries. You have to make sure that these binaries are never coming in, that they are never used directly or indirectly again. And if you're using Artifactory, you have a very comfortable way to do it because we have this Artifactory query language. It's in SQL style language that you can address or to use to define pattern to find all this stuff in the whole impact graph. So. Um, yeah, maybe I can share some links later. So if, if you're interested in this, ping, ping me. Um, I can share some documentation about how to get rid of this, um, this effective binaries uh, in Artifactory and to, to clean the whole infrastructure. But just having one dependencies. So we have we have two things. We have vulnerabilities and we have compliance issues. So what, what's the difference and what's the effort? And you as a developer, what you should focus first on and how difficult it is. What is a basic effort you have to deal with? First of all, compliance issues. Compliance issues is you have to identify what license in what part and you need it over all parts. So it, not only from the dependency you're consuming, but you need you must make sure that all transitive dependencies are in the same license or in valid license for your dedicated step as well. So for this first, you need someone who is able to decide or is responsible to decide what's the white label license and red labeled license in every production chain. So the license could be valid during development time, but not good if it is used in production, so in runtime. So you have to all reverse. So you, you really have need someone who's defining what is a good and what's a bad license and what stage. But if this is done, the machine can do the job. So the machine will just constantly scan. Make it sense to scan it constantly? Yes. Just have in mind that if you're relying on dependencies from other people, most open source projects are done in their spare time, at home, as a hobby, whatever. So don't expect that everybody is um, dealing with a lawyer to make sure that his project is good. No, and this I'm not expecting, but I need to be sure what's going on. So I need the full understanding. And if a developer of a library will change internally some dependencies, and it could happen that indirectly a license is changing. So never trust just the first level, go to all the fine detailed trees down to the last uh, step and check with every build more or less if the compliance issues are done. Okay, this is one part. What can you do without a lawyer? What can you do immediately? Well, you can scan for vulnerabilities because Scanning for vulnerabilities, you need no initial effort. You need a tool that's able to do it. You need a tool that's able to, to scan the whole text stack. Um, for example, if you want to try it out, uh, you can just um, use a free tier, uh, for example, from us, so that you have a CI environment, Art Factory, and X-Ray. And then you can do it in the CI pipeline, but you can do it already inside your IDE. You can connect to X-Ray, and if you're adding some dependencies, you have to do nothing else because the IDE plugin will told you, uh, will say to you, okay, this dependency you have will have this transitive dependencies and there is a vulnerability and you can fix it if you are increasing to the version number A or B. 
And this over the whole tech layer. So even if you have poly, uh, polyglot environments, like you're using a tool like Vardin, Vardin is an open source framework and uh, you have a Java interface, but in the end, it's generating a web application, circle container web application based on web components. So in the end, you have two large cycles. You have the Maven large cycle and you have the NPM stack. And if you're using X-Ray and you have everything over Artifactory, they are aware even with a semantic break because you're crossing the board of technologies. And even there you will see my Java dependency is clean, but the corresponding NPM package, that's crap. So this is done, but the effort will be always if the human has to decide what's going on. So the human has to say, okay, now we have to change. What are you doing or what's the different behavior? The good thing with compliance and the bad thing with compliance issues is you just have single dots. If you have a compliance issue, you have to remove it and you have to replace it with a semantic equal implementation because the project itself is in a wrong license. So vulnerabilities is a little bit different. If you have vulnerabilities in different layers, each vulnerability could be with a lower CVSS value. By the way, if you want to know what CVSS is, Convulnerability Scoring System, I have a YouTube um, a talk about um, CVSS Explained. I will show a little bit the different metrics, uh, what does it mean and so on. But uh, let's say it's a CVSS value is some kind of a value. If it is higher, it's a higher risk, a higher possible risk. If it is a lower value, it's a lower possible risk. Just, just the easiest version of it. It's not completely true. But, um, the bad thing with vulnerabilities is you can combine them to different attack vectors. So you're not only dealing with single vulnerabilities, but you're dealing with different attack vectors. So you need the full impact graph. So it makes no sense to scan just one technology because you have no clue what's going up, uh, going around. Um, but the good thing is with vulnerabilities to get rid of a vulnerability, mostly it's good to change the version of the same um, dependency. So you don't have to replace with a semantic equal implementation. You just have to uh, create a new composition of the same components in different versions. It's a long sentence. Huh? So um, what's the biggest part what we can do or what's what's a in, a in a lifetime of a vulnerability? What's the part what we can influence? I don't want to go in detail. If you want to see it, um, I, I have a detailed information out there in, in the internet, but um, we have different stages from vulnerability is found until this is public available. Can you influence it? No, because we are no uh, security researchers. We have no, no, no fingers there, what, what can use. We can spend some money to, to say, okay, um, if someone's able to find a vulnerability, we will pay some money. That's the only thing you can do, but you are not searching by yourself. On the other side, if this public information is public available, this is part where you can have the first time access to it. And this is exactly what we're doing. We, we don't want to focus just on one vulnerability databases. We are StrayFrog, we are merging vulnerability databases to build a superset because everybody is specialized somehow or has different parts of the vulnerabilities or different parts of the technology. And we need all technology because we want to have the full impact graph. So we are merging vulnerability databases and merge vulnerability databases means that don't go to someone who's offering one vulnerability database, go to someone who's merging because then you have the superset. And then this information is consumable by you. And at this point, if, if this is consumable by you, so you have access to it and you can use it in a way that the machine can use it because just a description of vulnerability is just useless. Um, the time starts running for you because now from you have access for, uh, to this information until it's fixed in production is exactly where you should focus. And this is a critical pass and mostly a very long pass if you're not aware of vulnerabilities. And it's a worst pass because it's a, until it's, or in the moment, the information about vulnerabilities is public available. Everybody's a, able to see this information. It's even worse if there is a patch because then you have a very detailed knowledge out for free how to use this vulnerability and yeah it's just worst case so you, you have to rate fast and this is exactly what you um, influence as best because if you have the working host the ci environment that's just doing the machine work then this time is minimized and then it's just you has to react and what's the best safety belt here 
test coverage. So if you are good with test coverage, so if you're providing a very strong test coverage, then you can easily switch between different versions and let the machine, machine do the rest. And this is exactly what's your best safety belt if you as a developer wants to start. You need this information as early as possible. Inside your IDE, for example, you need this vulnerability information that you're immediately changing this dependencies or a new composition. You need a very efficient dependency management because this is influencing 99% of your whole tech stack corresponding to the amount of dependencies you're using. And what I'm suggesting is that you're not only going with line coverage. So personally, I have very, very good results with mutation testing because it's a mathematically way stronger test coverage compared to line coverage and branch coverage. So um, yeah, so this is what you can do. Focus on TDD, focus on an efficient dependency management, automate, um, go to an DevOps platform instead of building all these Patani pieces by yourself and maintaining this, uh, this so that this is easily done. And then you can just use your time for changing all this stuff. So summary of all is, if you're dealing with different technologies, if it is more um, domain specific things, the tooling is not so good. If you're going more to technology stuff, it's way better. The machine can do a lot of stuff. If you're looking at the whole tech stack, most people are forgetting the DevSecOps part itself. So the tool stack for your development chain, uh, the infrastructure and so on, they're just focusing on what they are writing, the, the applications they're coding. But even if you're looking inside this application, whatever architecture you're using, it doesn't matter. For every layer, mostly you have a corresponding dependency manager because mostly you're buying, you're using dependencies instead of creating everything by yourself. That means you need a single point, a single logical point. I don't speak about a single instance. I mean, nah, high available instance, but a logical point where all dependencies are going through from the internet so that you have a defined port where, where you can start scanning. And with X-Ray and the knowledge about the whole tech stack and the whole dependency management system, so really the whole metadata that's involved, you have the possibility to create the full impact graph and you have the possibility later to think about how to implement this executive order if you are um, influenced by this one, uh, with whatever reason could be direct or indirectly working for the government, um, so that you can extract the whole of the bills of material. So all this together is more or less working hand in hand. So if you want to start with security, focus on quality with TDD, take a strong um, test coverage, make sure that you have all binaries under control, store all binaries in a way that you have an immutable system, and make sure that you have a view on all directly or indirectly used technologies. So, wow, I'm done perfectly. So I think uh, it's a perfect time to ask me questions. It's a perfect time to give me some advice, what you want to hear is next, additionally, or whatever. If you like it, give me a thumbs up. And so let me see, Phil, you're back. Perfect. Yes, I am. I Hello. Will... Yes, I can hear you. No, now you're muted again. So. Yeah, I, it's on purpose. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So I have one question. Hi, Sven. Yeah, hi. Oh, this, sorry, this name is quite long. So um, what can I do for you? Please give me your, your question. I'll write it just in the chat, please. So otherwise I can, I hope everybody knows how to reach me or how to reach Phil. I think we can share our coordinates um, as well so that everybody's able, if something's coming later, that we are able to reach each other. I will stop sharing my screen so that we can see. And it other. looks like no. we, we do have a question there, which is, uh, could you describe more about mutation testing, please? Oh, mutation testing. So just, just a short answer, because I can't give you the full answer. That's a full talk. I can check if I'm able to find the link. I will find the link on YouTube. Otherwise, uh, search for Outdoor Nerd. Uh, this is my YouTube channel, and they have a talk. Mutation testing, what does it mean? Uh, mutation testing is um, you, you're testing against variations, mutations of your code, and check if your test coverage will detect this change. So 
if you have test coverage, everything is green and you're switching from smaller to smaller equal, for example, then one test must fail. If this is not the case, you can't decide if you're delivering the source code with smaller or with smaller equal. And this is a very, very strong test coverage. So, but, sorry, I have to redirect you to some other resource. Otherwise, ping me um, on some channel so I can redirect you to all this information and some recordings. But it's, it's worth to have a look at it. It's really cool. So, any other questions so far? Other questions? Let me see. Oh, where's my chat? Oh, here's my chat. So, any other questions? So, I'll. One of the one of the uh, things that that I always get asked uh, is, you know, what what is there that's like a uh, the most tricky part about getting started with with DevSecOps. Um, so I'll give my answer, then maybe you can give me yours. Um, my answer is uh, cultural, right? If, if you if you don't have a good culture established, you anything you try to put into place that's going to change the uh, kind of existing ways of doing things, it's going to fail. So you, you, it may fail. It probably will. Um, <clears throat> don't want to you know crush your dreams, but you definitely need uh, an executive sponsor, some kind of executive buy-in, someone higher up, much higher up in the in kind of the food chain that that will be a champion for you and for your your implementations of of, of DevSecOps. Um, so that that's a that's a big one for me. We do actually have another question uh, about container-defined infrastructure. Yeah, Phil, do you want to start with containers? It's, hey, Red Hat is a perfect place for containers, huh? I think yeah, I'm not, the I'm best not... one. <laughs> I think so... we, we are not really sure what the question means, so I need, we need more context about this one. So um, more about container defense infrastructure. Do you mean um, how to define infrastructure? Do you mean the infrastructure itself? Do you mean the techniques or best practices around the visualization in general. So please give us some advice to, to get more context because I have to say the truth. I'm not really sure what this question is. Sorry. Oh, Phil, do I have, do I have an idea? No, not, not yet, but I mean, I can, I, you know, I can speak briefly. If, if, we're, if we're talking about defining your, you know, oh, here we go. Uh, the role of containers, uh, Docker, Tomcat, Kubernetes. Okay. Um, Which start? Okay, yeah. I will start. So, okay. so first of all, Docker, Tomcat, and Kubernetes. So Tomcat I use, but it's not a container. It's a Surflake container. So uh, the word container is used in different semantic um, aspects. And if you hear the word container, you have to think about if you're talking about container for some kind of technology. And with Tomcat, it's a container for surflets. So it's for developing web apps. Yeah? So it's a quite old standard, but Tomcat one or Jetty is another container or Undertow. And these are containers, but for some kind of technology. When you're talking with Docker and Kubernetes, the big change between Docker is a para-virtualization. Para oh, for me, it's a difficult word. Para-virtualization. Para oh, damn, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for it. So it's, it's something that is not a full virtualized. So it means um, you need more or less the same operating system and you're just isolating different instances of this uh, operating system. And if you have a full virtualizer, it means you have a Windows machine and you can start Linux or you have a Linux machine and you can start Windows. Yeah? So you can wrap different operating systems. With Docker, you have the possibility to have different instances of more or less the same operating system. But I think we'll have way more information about this. And I think I think you for for the amount of time we have left, I think you you answered it pretty pretty well. So um, yeah, absolutely. And Kubernetes, we, we lost Kubernetes. Yeah. This is a lot of thing that's open. You want? Oh, in terms of, uh, I, I'm not I'm not sure that I I know what the context of the question is with as it relates to Kubernetes. So okay, so if if Tomcat is a container for technology and Docker is a container that's isolating operating system in one node, Kubernetes is how to orchestrate a bunch of this to have all this big zoo 
of nodes running around. So Kubernetes is responsible for spawning the nodes, decommissioning nodes. It's responsible for the orchestration, how many of these, uh, you have different wordings like pods, so a bunch of different nodes, but it's responsible for circuit breaking, for resilience and all these techniques. So it's an abstraction layer on top of the operating system. Docker is one instance, but Kubernetes is a huge amount of this. It is orchestrating all this stuff and make sure that it's easy to use. This is more in the field of a distributed system. Docker is a single operating system and the B is between a distributed system and a single operating system is, is huge. There is a, there's a good old book called from Mr. Tannenbaum and it's, it's quite old book, but it's one of the really good books to understand the mechanics of an operating system and the difference to distributed operating systems. You know, it's just old, but it's a good book. Uh, I think uh, I, I would be remiss if I did not uh, mention, you know, kind of the, the, uh, the, the framing of OpenShift uh, as, it, as it relates to Kubernetes. Um, you know, one of the, the big reasons that a lot of people are choosing OpenShift is that you, it's, there's a ton of stuff that's baked in uh, to the OpenShift container platform. So um, RBAC uh, uh, SSO, uh, uh, certificate management, uh, it, it, all these things that normally you would have to uh, con you know, configure on your own and implement on your own, or you know, via you know a guide or something along those lines with with vanilla Kubernetes and with OpenShift, you you don't have to do that. That's that's uh, we we manage all of that. So it's it, that that's one of the, the really big benefits of it. Plus, you know, enterprise support and all this other stuff. So, uh, so we've got three minutes left. Uh, I have I've, I've one thing I have to search for the operating system book, Tannenbaum. Uh, and during the time I'm doing this one, you can select the next question if you want. I, 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 found, still... the word. I found the word. Okay, so, Mr. I have Modern Operating System, fourth edition. I'm not sure if this is the last one, the last version of it. Oh, where's my Zoom? Where's my Zoom? Come on. Okay, here you will get it. And Tannenbaum, I'm always writing it in German. Tannenbaum is a Christmas tree. Sorry for this. <laughs> it's just it's just one N. So here is a is a link to Amazon to the book. I think it's an English version. Otherwise, you are not able to find it. And yeah, it's it's a good thing. So I really recommend it. And if you need more insights, I just let me know later. So the last we had some. I think I don't see anything else. I think we're we're probably okay to wrap up a little bit early. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah let's, going, I'm going. Let's so if there's any question, let us know. We are here, so it's yeah. a last chance to grab us before we are starting with our closing words. So, often we have to think about closing words now. So we will have. Oh, some. it's okay. <laughs> I've, I've got some. <clears throat> I've got some. Uh, well, so I want to thank you, Sven, for taking the time to to, to walk us through this. Um, that I, I learned some stuff uh, that I was, I was very happy to, uh, I'm always happy to learn some new stuff. And I hope that it was uh, really useful for, for all of our attendees. We're going to be recording that, well, it's already been recorded. It's, uh, the recording will go out uh, if, you've, uh, if you've signed up uh, by email. If you couldn't make it, no problem. You'll be hearing this in the future. So hello from the past. And uh, yeah, Sven, um, I think that's about it. You got anything, anything you want to finish with? Oh, I just want to say thank you for everybody who attended here. Thank you for your patience so that you stayed so long here, whatever time zone you are in. I'm in Germany, so for me it's at late. And I would to, uh, really appreciate to see you somewhere on my social media channels, on Twitter, on YouTube, on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect and I'm more than happy to start a communication and to have access to all these communities that are around. So I think grab Phil, grab me, if you are interested in more insights or if you have a cool community around, let us know. I'm personally open to join your community in person or virtually, it depends a little bit on the big thing, yeah? But um, to give more insights. So from this, thank you very much. I'm done. I see a lot of thank you. Thank you so much for this. No questions left. A perfect job and we are in time. All righty. Okay. Thanks, Ben. We okay. will uh, we'll end here and uh, we'll see you see you next time. Okay, bye.
Cheers. Bye.